Welcome everyone and good evening. I'm Gina Veramo. By day, I'm the outreach manager for NOVA, but by night, I am thrilled to be your host for this month's Beyond the Page Book Club. Thank you for joining us for our 13th edition of this monthly book talk. And tonight, I will be joined by our special guest, Sarah Penner, author of The Lost Apothecary. Before we get started, I want to give a very special thank you to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with Beyond the Page Book Club this month. Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. And if you've never been, I highly recommend grabbing brunch or a pastry or a coffee and peruse their great selection. You can visit them in-store at 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week or on their website 24-7. So let's talk a little bit about how this will work. So you won't see yourself on video and you won't be able to speak during the author interview. However, that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. So you, what we want you to do is to ask your questions by opening up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your page uh, and type in your question. Uh, if you put, you can put your questions in at any point in time during the interview. Um, and I'm trying to include as many as I can throughout the discussion. No need to wait for the second half of our interview. So if you have a question now, put it in. And I already see, we're already using the Q&A. Great, <laughs> that's perfect. If you see something that you really want the answer to, vote for it by clicking on the thumbs up to move it up to the top of the list. Just like it's happening right now, excellent. <laughs> we'll do our best to ask the most popular questions at the beginning. So Zoom has recently rolled out an automated captioning feature, and we're excited to be able to offer this so that anyone can enjoy our events. So if you want to turn on the closed captioning feature, um, you can click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Um, two transcription display options will pop up, and we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. Uh, and a sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Uh, please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed, so uh, it won't necessarily be a real-time update. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Penner. Um, and Sarah Penner is the New York Times and internationally best-selling author of The Lost Apothecary, which will be translated into more than 30 languages worldwide. A graduate of University of Kansas, Sarah spent 13 years in corporate finance and now writes full time. Uh, she and her husband live in St. Petersburg, Florida. And to learn more, you can visit her website, sarahpenner.com. And Sarah's going to start us off this evening with an excerpt from her novel. So please, Sarah, get us started. Yes, thank you so much, Gina. And before I read the first couple of pages from the book, I want to start by thanking you, of course, for hosting tonight to Trident Bookstore, to everyone who's working behind the scenes um, with Beyond the Page, and everyone, of course, who's tuning in. I think that there's a lot of you from what I'm seeing. I do a lot of book clubs, but this is definitely one of the better crowds. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I know a lot of us have Zoom fatigue, but I really appreciate everyone taking the time to pop in tonight. And like Gina said, please ask your questions. I There's nothing I haven't been asked at this point. And if I don't want to answer it, I'll just tell you I don't want to answer it. So definitely don't be shy. So I figure that most of you have read the book, but there are probably a few on the call that haven't read the book. And um, every so often I get asked to do a short reading. And so for this um, event, I am going to just read about two minutes. And if you've got The Lost Apothecary next to you, definitely feel free to, yep, Gina's got her copy. Definitely feel free to read along. And some people don't like to read along. They just want to hear the author and that's perfectly fine. So I'm just going to read five paragraphs. And this chapter was really important just to give you a, a, a brief insight from the author's perspective the first few pages, you're trying to set the scene for the whole story. And that's exactly what I meant to accomplish in chapter one. It is Nella's point of view. So she, of course, is the apothecary and her story is the crux of the entire book. And it takes place in 1791. And it brings the reader right into her hidden sinister apothecary shop. So the whole chapter is meant to feel sort of sinister and spooky. So I'm gonna read just uh, about a page, um, page and a half. So let's get started. 
All right, so this is Nella, as I said, and this takes place February 3rd, 1791. She would come at daybreak, the woman whose letter I held in my hands, the woman whose name I did not yet know. I knew neither her age nor where she lived. I did not know her rank in society nor the dark things of which she dreamed when night fell. She could be a victim or a transgressor, a new wife or a vengeful widow, a nursemaid or a courtesan. But despite all that I did not know, I understood this. The woman knew exactly who she wanted dead. I lifted the blush colored paper illuminated by the dying flame of a single rush wick candle. I ran my fingers over the ink of her words, imagining what despair brought the woman to seek out someone like me, not just an apothecary, but a murderer, a master of disguise. Her request was simple and straightforward for my mistress's husband with his breakfast, daybreak, 4th of February. At once, I drew to mind a middle-aged housemaid called to do the bidding of her mistress. And with an instinct perfected over the last two decades, I knew immediately the remedy most suited to this request, a chicken egg laced with Nux Vomica. The preparation would take mere minutes. The poison was, with, was within reach. But for a reason yet unknown to me, something about the letter left me unsettled. It was not the subtle woodsy odor of the parchment or the way the lower left corner curled forward slightly as though one stamp with tears. Instead, the disquiet brood inside of me, an intuitive understanding that something must be avoided. But what unwritten warning could reside on a single sheet of parchment shrouded beneath pen strokes? None at all, I assured myself, this letter was no omen. My troubling thoughts were merely the result of my fatigue, the hour was late, and the persistent discomfort in my joints. I drew my attention to my calfskin register on the table in front of me. My precious register was a record of life and death, an inventory of the many women who sought potions from here, the darkest of apothecary shops. What a great introduction to Nella and the story. I love it. And I just to start us off with a first question that I'm sure a lot of folks are thinking about right now. When I heard that this book was about women dispensing poisons to get revenge on men that wronged them, I immediately was like, yes, sign <laughs> me up. I was in. And maybe my reaction in itself is the answer to this question, but what inspired you to write this novel and tell this story? Yes. So the inspiration for this story is hands down the most common question that I get. And I'm glad that this is the first question you're asking because someone I'm sure has already asked it in the Q and A. They have, so, yeah. Yeah. So when I think about like the generation or the genesis of this idea, it was several years ago and I've always loved the idea of an apothecary. So when I think of just the word apothecary in itself, it's very enchanting and alluring and it kind of has witchy vibes. And you imagine just like this woman um, kind of in this, this truly like exactly as described in my book, this back alleyway in a hidden room blending tinctures and potions and remedies. And the interesting thing is at the time when I was thinking about writing a story about an apothecary, I asked myself, okay, what other historical fiction or just even contemporary fiction could I go read at the bookstore about an apothecary? And I realized there really are not many stories or novels that exist about apothecaries. And so I realized that we have this really enchanting, alluring premise, but nothing on the market uh, about it today. And that is like the sweet spot where all authors want to be is some, a really hooky premise, but it hasn't yet been written. And so I knew I wanted the apothecary to be sinister, not necessarily evil. She's not a villain, but I knew I wanted there to be something dark about her. And that took me down the route of poison. I also wanted to write a book that had a bit of a feminist angle. So I knew early on that she would be a helper of women. Um, and then of course, those two things, if you kind of blend them together, you're helping women, but you're selling poisons. Where does that leave us? Right. That, that tells us that these women probably want poison to off the men in their lives. So it really kind of happened organically, but I would say that the apothecary herself was the very first um, seed of an idea that I had I've always had a little bit of interest in gardening and teas and essential oils, certainly not as much as some people, but a little bit. And so I was able to do so much fun research and I'm sure we'll talk about research later, but it was just kind of a natural interest of mine anyways. So it was just the perfect story for me to tell. 
Yeah, and you know, speaking about that that feminist angle a little bit, I loved really loved and identified with Nella's commitment to helping other women feel seen and feel heard. Uh, and especially this one point in the book really stood out to me where she says, it's a promise I made to my mother to preserve the existence of these women whose names will otherwise be erased from history. This register preserves them, at their names, their memories, and their worth. And I'm just curious of how the, could that can translate to, you know, what we do daily. How can we preserve the history and the voices of women in our community? Yes. So what you just asked is really one of the primary themes of the book is giving voice to the lesser known women in history or unknown women in history. And anyone who reads a lot of historical fiction, I'm sure we have some tuning in tonight, will notice that over the last several years, the uh, big publishers have been putting out a lot of historical fiction books about women, whether real people or fictional characters and representations, we're seeing um, just a lot of women in these untold stories finally coming to light. So it's that's great that we're seeing that trend. The Lost Apothecary is interesting in that none of the characters were real people. So I'm not necessarily giving voice to someone that existed that was buried and now I want to share the word about. But what I'm doing is through Nella, she's really kind of rep represents and, and um, is, is honoring these, the idea of all of the women that history has covered up. So if you think 1791, the, I mean, really, unless you're part of the royal family or the monarchy, you, you don't know many women who lived in 1791. And, and if you open textbooks, if you open any, any book, you're not going to find the names of women who lived then. And so Nella is trying to address that throughout the story. Part of it is the legacy her mother left to honor everybody, especially the women. Um, and so Nella wants to adhere to that, but she also just recognizes that everyone has worth. And so it's interesting because um, through dual timeline historical fiction and the lost apothecary is dual timeline. So we've got a present day narrative and a historical narrative. That's a really uh, effective way to show the reader how things have changed and how things are different today than they used to be. And so if we look at what has changed uh, in 1791, Nella's customers, they resorted to poison if they wanted to change their situation or free themselves from an unhappy marriage or what have you. But the present day narrative with Caroline, she chooses to go back to school. And I don't want to give away spoilers, but she is kind of on a self journey and a self exploration. Mm -hmm. um, so we see how those are treated differently, but the same, the same theme and, and this common idea of betrayal and lack of trust and, and how to honor women, that is kind of a common thread through both narratives. So that's one of my favorite things about dual timeline historical fiction is, is kind of exploring both sides. Yeah, and I mean, just hearing you say that as well, one of the pieces of the book that really struck me was that a lot of women turned to Nella because male doctors didn't believe them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that a lot of women, a lot of my friends, my family, you know, they've gone to doctors, explained their pain, explained a different illness, and doctors have kind of sent them off and said, oh, you're fine, you know, take an Advil, relax things like that. Um, so I loved that you were able to draw, a, you know, a lot of those parallels that women, even though it was the 1700s, we think we've come so far, but a lot of these social things are still being experienced in both timelines. And I think you really used that narrative to, you know, share that with everyone. Yeah, definitely. I had someone recently ask, you know, why does Nella just help women? Why not be a helper of everybody, all, men and women. And, and I say what you just said about these bespectacled gentlemen, that's how they're explained in the book or described in the book with brandy on their breaths. They are kind of um, looking at women and, and judging them in sort of an unhealthy, unproductive way. And so Nella's mother's shop existed to give women this refuge and a safe place to get help. But to your point, Gina, I think that we still struggle with this today. So Yet again, another example of how some things don't, don't necessarily change with the passage of time. Right. Um, I wanna get to some audience questions. We have already have over 20 in the chat. So let's get to as many as we can. Um, our first question, which is the most popular one, which you might be able to guess what it is, um, is from Teresa and she wants to know, will there be a sequel? 
So I, uh, before I answer this, Gina, give me some guidance because I, the way that I would typically answer it is a little bit, not, it's a little bit of a spoiler, not a big spoiler, but it, it, it mentions a character. So you tell me, like, am I free to kind of, kind of answer or should I not? Well, you know what, before you do that, let's take a quick poll. So um, we actually have a poll for the audience. Um, so we do discuss the end of the book typically. So this will uh, like help us gauge how vigilant we need to be with letting folks know about spoilers. So you should just see that a poll popped up on your screen if you finished the book or not. So uh, please let us know if you have, if you haven't, but you're still okay with spoilers, or if you want warnings about any major spoilers so you can, you know, close your laptop, go into the other room or anything like that. So um, take a minute or two uh, to pop that in the chat before we talk about the end, because I know I have a lot of questions about the end and I'm sure a lot of other folks do too. And in the interest of answering the question, as, as you kind of were pulling up that poll, I was thinking of ways that I could answer it satisfactorily without giving away any spoilers. Um, the short answer is yes, I envision telling more of the story someday. It's not what I'm working on now. It's not um, in the works. It's not under contract. But I will say that just in my heart, I envision someday telling more story and um, for anyone who has read the book, you know that there is a character who that door is kind of open for that to happen. And so it's, it's her story that I would like to tell the rest of. And um, so I just saw the results come up mm -hmm. kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to, I mean, the short answer is, is there is more that I would like to tell, but it's not imminent. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> um, another question that we have, um, a very popular question from Teresa is about mudlarking, which I did not know was a thing. Um, have you, how did you find out about it? Um, and have you gone and did you find anything interesting when you went? Yeah. So I first learned about mudlarking, I think through Instagram and then several years ago, oh, I guess it was about four or five years ago. I got a book um, for Christmas from my mother-in-law with, and I actually have it, um, grab it and hope that nothing falls. One time I was on video and like everything fell and it was terribly loud and embarrassing, but <laughs> it happens. This so, time you did it beautifully. <laughs> so this is the book. Um, this is called London in Fragments by Ted Sandlane. And this came out, like I said, about five or so years ago. And this is all of um, these really cool things that he has found in the River Thames in London while mudlarking. So I was going through this and lo and behold, there's also an apothecary jar. And about this oh, time I was kind of having this idea of an apothecary. And so it was like very uh, serendipitous mm -hmm. that he has a, a picture of a fragment. It wasn't all that uncommon though. I mean, apothecaries were all over the city. So it wasn't that much of a coincidence. But like, this is a handle of a jar. Um, there's all kinds of, yeah, here's some clay pipes. So he's got cool photos. And when I, oh, I did go mudlarking um, in July of 2019 to answer your other question. And I found mostly pottery and uh, a lot of it had blues and purples. Um, it, you know, really it's like not that interesting. I think a lot of people would probably consider these little pottery fragments to be just trash or, or garbage. But for me, I think exactly what Caroline says in the story, who did this last belong to? What part of a plate or a bowl was this part of? And who ate off of that plate? And whose house was the, this in? And I think a lot of historical fiction authors say that, that they'll pass an old house. And to them, it's not just an old house. They're looking up in the little attic windows and wondering, has anyone ever lived there? Is there any drama or scandalous stories that took place there? And that's how I work. So mudlarking was a great way to engage with history in a really realistic way. Um, so in addition to the pottery, I found a, a, a portion of a clay pipe, which is very common. We learned that in the story. I found some animal bones. Um, and then if you actually, anyone who's been on my Instagram page, if you scroll to the very, very bottom, some of my first posts, I have a picture of everything I found. Um, and mudlarking, by the way, is open to anybody. You do have to have a permit, but now that lockdowns are being lifted, if anyone's planning to go to London in the near future, I would highly suggest getting a permit 
and going down to the river. It's such a fun way to spend an afternoon and really get out of the museums and the, the touristy area era, areas and find something different and unique. Mm -hmm. Great. That's wonderful. Um, so did you, to inspire you to go mudlarking, did you find yourself a, have you always been interested in history like Caroline or, you know, did you find that, connect, do you feel that connection? Yeah. So one thing that I think uh, authors probably don't share because it could get them into a lot of trouble is oftentimes their characters that they write have a fair bit in common with that author who's actually writing that. And there are a lot of things about me that are in Caroline. And one of those key character traits is everything she says about hating history in school and kind of the textbook history, but feeling more connected to the real history of real people, not battles and wars and politicians, but just middle-class people who lived their lives and had children and got married and went to normal jobs. That has always interest, interested me. And that's why historical fiction has always been my favorite genre is because it's a way to really go into the house and just kind of figure out how people lived and what sorts of problems they were facing. So, but in high school, for instance, I hated history. Um, I mean, it was just all like wars and laws. And I just, that's so dry and uninteresting to me. And I'm glad that as an adult, I have found that there's another way into learning about things that happened in the past. And that is historical fiction. Awesome. So we have a lot of questions about the end. So based off of the poll, um, it's we will talk about spoilers, but we will warn you ahead of time. So um, if the answer to some of these questions contain spoilers, uh, let's just make sure we let everybody know. Um, but a lot of people want to know, um, how did Eliza get rescued? Yes. So um, this is, yeah, this is a spoiler. So yeah. I guess put us on mute. And then when it, when the camera jumps back over to Gina, you know that we're on to the next question. Um, so yes, that, let me just kind of back up there. There's a subgenre in historical fiction known as magical realism. And the lost apothecary is a quintessential example of magical realism. And what magical realism means is throughout the story, the reader and the characters should be asking, is what just happened the result of magic or what, is it real? Is it reality? Did it really happen? So magical realism, that's where that comes from. So the first way that I would answer your question is there are probably a number of things that the readers and all of you listening want to know was that magic and was that, or was that real? And what I always say is as the author, if I wanted you to know, I would have explicitly stated whether it was magic or real, but the whole fun of it is leaving that little bit of doubt in there. So that said that this kind of like, you get to interpret it how you want, but that said, absolutely. The, t the vial was what saved Eliza. Um, you know, I think that there's opportunity for people to think, well, maybe it was just luck that she fell into this icy river and she happened to swim out. It's not certainly out of the realm of possibility, but in my mind, 100% magic is real in my story. And that's what saved her. And she, you know, she says later that she felt the heat of it so much so that the icy water was almost a relief to her. So um, that's, that's the answer. Awesome. Yeah, we're, I have one more question about a couple other questions about the ending as well. Um, so this could be a spoiler for folks as well. Um, with Caroline's decision that the truth is important. Um, so thinking about deciding to tell her parents what her husband did. Um, why does she choose to keep Eliza's history to herself? And why does she throw the bottle she found mudlarking uh, back into the river, even though it was the basis of her dissertation? Yes. So, okay. So we've got two questions there. The first one is a little more of a kind of a nuanced answer um, in that I love the idea of connections between characters, especially women that really can't be articulated or defined. And when I was thinking about how Caroline would feel at the end of this huge discovery she's made, she knows she wants to write her dissertation about Nella's apothecary shop, but I love the idea of her still keeping one secret to herself. I think of that just as 
kind of endearing, very human. I mean, how many of us, if you think about, you know, someone, a family member or a friend reveals this really big thing to you, um, but, you know, there's a piece that they just can't share. There's, that's just so human to me that, that we, would, we would share like 90% and just keep a little piece in our heart. So when I was writing that scene, I just felt, and it's, it's so hard to articulate, but I just felt like there's a little something Caroline's going to keep to herself and it's going to be Eliza. Maybe it's a matter of respect um, that the real apothecary um, or the, the lost apothecary would forever be lost and kind of protected with Caroline. There's a lot of ways to think of it. Like I said, it's kind of nuanced. The question that's easier to answer is why she threw the vial in the river which I have quickly learned infuriates a lot of people and people get really fired up and defensive when I ask this question, but it never fails when I tell them why they're all like, oh, okay, that makes so much sense. So here's why she throws the vial back in the river. So she has this vial, she's figured out that it changed and saved Eliza's life. She, of course, has been on this whirlwind self-discovery trip over the last week in London, so it has changed her life. So she has two options. She can either take the vial home with her and set it on her mantle or her nightstand, and it's going to, what, sit there for the next 50 years and collect dust and do no one any good, or knowing the power in this small object, she can kind of selflessly return it to the river, this this body of water that goes through the entire city and will over time impact possibly hundreds of people's lives. So she can return it to the river, kind of give back to the universe what was given to her with the knowledge that maybe it will save someone else someday. So I think of it as a really selfless decision. Um, I just can't see, maybe it's because I'm a minimalist and I don't want my house full of little trinkets and vials, but I just think like, okay, it either collects dust or she changes someone else's life someday. And I think that second option is so much more compelling. Yeah. And it also adds to that thread of, you know, that thread of magic that's mm -hmm. kind of throughout the whole book as well, that we hear Eliza talking about magic at first. And then, you know, at the end of the book, we really hear Caroline say that she's embraced magic. Um, so I think that's a very fitting, you know, decision for her and the path that she's taken. Yeah. And she knows she's going to go back to the apothecary shop with researchers and professionals, and she's going to have all sorts of vials at her disposal to research and study and use to support her dissertation. So it kind of, you know, it connects to keeping Eliza as a secret. It's just, there's something she wants to give back to the universe. And um, I think at one point my editor even asked, like, are you sure you want to do that? And I was, I felt very strongly about it. I didn't want her to just take it home and set it on a mantle. I think the vial, it, it deserves more of a future than that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question from Marjorie who wants to know what authors inspire your own writing? Yes. So there are a few. Um, I will start with Fiona Davis. She's, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of her. Um, she, we actually share the same agent, a literary agent. And the reason why I like Fiona Davis is because her, or her um, style of writing is very commercial and accessible historical fiction. So if you think about like Ken Follett, he's on one side of the spectrum. If you pick up a Ken Follett book, like The Pillars of the Earth, for one, it's very long. It's like a thousand pages long. It's very deep and dense and intense. On the other side of the spectrum, you have writers like myself or Fiona Davis, where you could be on a train, you could be in a car, you could be waiting in your kid's pickup line, and you can pick up a Fiona Davis novel. Can fall it? Maybe not. You kind of need to be sitting down with an hour of time on your hands. So I like her style. So she's one. Mm -hmm. um, another author that I really like is Erin Morgan Stearns. She, of course, wrote The Night Circus. I like her use of magical realism. I love her use of the passive voice, which the industry tells us not to write in the passive mm -hmm. voice, that it's a huge no-no. But I think the passive voice is really beautiful and poetic and effective. And she writes in that, in the night circus. And I love that. Um, so I, I also like that she breaks rules. I'm, I'm a big fan of rule breaking, especially yes. as an author. Sarah Waters, I'm a huge fan of hers. Uh, I'm actually reading Affinity right now and absolutely loving it. 
Um, so she's another favorite. And then the last one I'll say is Kate Morton. She's kind of what I would consider sits between Sarah Waters on the literary side and Fiona Davis on the, the con uh, co contemporary side. She kind of sits in the middle um, and I love her stories and so many of them are set in the UK as well. And I'm very much an Anglophile. So that's a handful of my inspirations, I'd say. Excellent, cool. Well, we need to take a very quick break at the moment. Um, and we're gonna hear from Jamie Reese and about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only uh, through Beyond the Page, but for all the virtual events that we continue to provide. So Jamie, welcome to Beyond the Page. Thank you, so great to be here. And uh, hello everybody at home, glad you could join us this evening as we uh, talk about the Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. Uh, so, you know, I have to say it's always so wonderful to see a community of people brought together by a great story. And The Lost Apothecary is definitely an example of that. So if you enjoyed tonight's Beyond the Page event, then please consider making a donation. Are you a GBH sustainer? Do you know what a GBH sustainer is? Well, if not, let me tell you. A GBH sustainer is an ongoing and reliable source of support for GBH, allowing us to keep the news and your favorite programs on air and online. You watch and listen to GBH programs all year long, right? So why not spread out your support for GBH throughout the year? Today, if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, we will send you an autographed copy of next month's featured selection. It's right behind me here. It's called The People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. And we guarantee you will have it before our next event, which is happening Monday, July 12th. All it takes is $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, whatever works for you and your wallet. It's really easy. Just click on that chat link you see in our Zoom chat. It's wgbh.org slash support. Or if you have a phone handy and would prefer to use your phone, just text GBH to 800-204-3811. That's 800-204-3811. All it takes is a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card each month. And you'll feel so good doing it. You know, as we approach the end of our fiscal year on June 31st, your support today will help us reach our fundraising goals for the year. That is so important. Please help us present more stories during Beyond the Page events and inside your home. And if you're already a member, thank you so much for your support. And we hope to see you all during next month's Beyond the Page event. So until then, happy summer reading everyone. And, uh, Back to Gina. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. So we're going to continue our discussion with Sarah. Um, please, we are still taking questions. So um, drop them in the Q&A feature, and we will try to get to as many as we can during the rest of our time together. So I'm going to hop right back into the audience questions. Um, the one at the top of our list, which I'm sure you've also heard before, is do you think we'll be seeing Lost Apothecary in movie theaters anytime soon? Yes, so um, there's been some recent news and anyone who follows me on social media will have seen this. I think I announced it two weeks ago. So the Fox optioned, Fox Entertainment optioned The Lost Apothecary for a drama series. Ooh. So we won't be seeing it in movie theaters, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we see it on our TV screens. Um, what the press release came out through Deadline, they're a huge industry um, media outlet for Hollywood and LA. And what's kind of explained in there, although they gloss over it. And so I've been telling a lot of people who they read that article and they think, oh my gosh, when are we going to see it? Like, when is it going to hit the television? And what I tell them is there's still a lot of um, people to attach to the production. So that's what you call, you, you attach a director, you attach uh, a producer. So we still need a writer, we need a producer. There's still a lot of roles and empty seats to fill. So that said, I mean, yes, Fox optioned it. It's that we have a studio that's huge. That's actually one of the bigger hurdles that 
Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times uh, shows have the producer, they have the writer, but they don't have a studio. They can't find someone to air it on the network. So we have gotten through one of the big hurdles. So I cross my fingers every day that I'll get a call or an email from my film agent and she'll say, we've got everyone we need, like this is a go. Uh, but yes, it's very exciting. That's so exciting. I also love this as a drama series too, because it just gives you more time to like delve into each character, you know, get into the story a bit more, whereas things can get lost in like a two hour movie. Yeah. And what's interesting, I'll, I'll admit, I was peeking through the Q and A um, when we were doing the fundraiser bit and someone asked, um, I'm going down a little bit about why add the contemporary element when the historical tale could have stood on its own. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is, uh, and I've never really shared this on a book club, but I'm going to share it now. When writing the story, to me, it was the two tales, the two narratives were always intertwined. They could not be separated. And part of that is because when we think about the title, The Lost Apothecary, anytime something is lost, it's implied that it could be found. And I wanted the apothecary Nella in this story to be so good at what she did and, and so good at hiding her shop that no one in her own life would ever find her. But I wanted a woman someday to find her. I wanted this to be discovered and uncovered. So writing the book, the two, there was never a question for me that I was going to have two narratives. Mm -hmm. But every time I picture, I'm circling back now to the Fox thing. Every time I picture this on screen, I only can see and imagine the historical narrative. And mm -hmm. some people have said, well, it would be like Outlander. Um, anyone who's seen that on Showtime, I think, you know, we see both, pre um, or it's not present day, it's like 1940s and in the 1700s. We see both and that production team did a great job with that. But I just don't see the contemporary storyline in a TV drama series. I just picture all of these customers going into Nella's shop with their scandalous stories and these men that they want dead. And I, I would honestly be okay if the, um, if Hollywood adapted it in that way and they just went with the historical narrative. But when I think about this, this, the book itself, I'm, I'm glad that I did the contemporary storyline and I felt like it was important to complete and wrap up Nella's, her story and her expertise. Yeah, there is a question about your writing process for that that I want to get to, but there is just one question. If you could like pie in the sky, cast anyone as Nella, who would you want to play Nella? Yeah, so um, I tell this to people all the time that I hardly watch ever any any TV. Like our TV is almost never on. I, I don't know why we just tend to, my husband and I, we read a lot of books, mm -hmm. but um, so I'm terrible with actors and actresses, but I will say that I love Kathy Bates in Misery. And yes. although she's very sinister and evil and terribly evil in that movie, I think that Kathy Bates as an actress could do a phenomenal job playing Nella. Um, and, and so I, that's kind of who I see uh, that, you know, might do a good job. That's uh, that's great. Cause she can also be so warm too. Exactly. And that's why she, she's so evil in misery is that she is so warm on the surface. Um, but yeah, she's a phenomenal actress. Great. So yeah, getting back to thinking about um, the timelines, the contemporary timeline and the historical mm -hmm. timeline. Um, uh, we have an audience question that wants to know when you wrote the book, did you write Nella's timeline in its entirety and then Caroline's timeline in its entirety and then combine them by breaking them into alternating chapters or what was your process like for that? Yeah. So this is always interesting, particularly if we have any budding writers in the group or anyone who just kind of is interested in the behind the scenes process for an author. So Typically an author does a first draft and it's ugly. And you're really just trying to get the key pillars of the story down. And so my first draft for The Lost Apothecary, I wrote Nella first and I completed as much of her story as I could. And it was again, a very rough draft. Then I wrote Caroline's and she, of course, throughout the story is finding and uncovering things that happened to Nella. So she kind of had to come second because right. otherwise I would be writing things that I, I didn't even know existed yet. And then the third and final character was Eliza. And she kind of came about in an interesting way. When I first 
started envisioning this story, Eliza was a side character, but not a point of view character. Mm -hmm. And then I distinctly remember I wrote one of the early scenes where we see Nella dispensing this, um, this poison and an egg to Eliza. Eliza has come into the shop and she walks out and she's got the eggs in her pocket. And I asked myself at that time, what does the reader most want to see now? What would be the most compelling scene to make them turn the page and keep themselves hooked on this story? And I thought, well, what I would want to see is I would want to be right next to Eliza when she gives this guy poison. And I would want to see and feel her fear. I would want to see what's happening to his body when he's eating his scrambled eggs or his, his gravy, whatever it is. Like, I would want to see this happen. And I don't want this to be Eliza telling Nella later. I don't want it to be a flashback. I want this to be real time through Eliza's point of view. And that was how Eliza came to life in the story. I wrote a chapter from her point of view, kind of just as an experiment. And I loved it. I think that she's super um, inquisitive. She's a lot of comic relief for Nella, who's like very dark and grieving and vengeful. But Eliza's kind of meant to just give you a, breath of fresh air. She certainly did for me when I was writing her character. And I think she probably does for a lot of readers too. Uh, but so that's, that's a little bit about, you know, I I wrote each character, I drafted each character on her own. Mm -hmm. Then once you are revising a book, you're kind of untangling everything and re threading it back together. You really have no choice at that time, but to take the book chronologically and you're going to go Nella, Eliza, Caroline. You just don't, you don't have the luxury anymore of saying, well, I'm just going to stick with one character um, through the book. You have to kind of start blending them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Eliza was a great, you know, I don't want to say a palate cleanser, but you know, she like, you know, got like, it, it was a nice breath of fresh air, just like you said, between Caroline and Nella, it really helped blend you know, blend the three of them together. Yeah. I actually like that palate cleanser. I might start using that because <laughs> that is kind of what she's like. Yeah. Um, so our, our audience would like to know, uh, what's the most difficult, what was the most difficult scene for you to write? And why? Oh gosh. Um, the most difficult scene for me to write is probably the one that's about midway through the book where, Nella and Eliza have collected the beetles from the field and now they're kind of spending the night. They've, they've, um, gotten into this guy's barn. They're effectively trespassing. Um, and they're passing the rest of the night in this barn until the carriages start running again in the morning. And Nella is trying to explain to a 12 year old why she does what she does. And that was just a very important, important dialogue scene, but it was also slower. Um, I naturally lean towards writing cliffhangers and I like, I call them mic drops, which is like information reveals that the reader wasn't expecting. That's what I love writing. And this scene is not that it's a really important scene where we're learning about the most important thing, which is why Nella sells poison. She's finally Mm -hmm. revealing it to Eliza but it's dark and she's explaining the things that have happened to her um, and to her body in a way that would make sense to a, a prepubescent 12 year old. Right. And that's just a lot to do in, I think it's like a eight page scene or something. So um, it was a lot to accomplish. And we, my editor and I went through a lot of revisions on it to get it right. And it was just a heavy scene to write anyways, very emotional for the reader, for the author, for everybody. So that's kind of the one that sticks out to me that was the most difficult. Oh my gosh. As soon as I I, read, I finished that chapter, I my mom was reading the book as well at the same time. And I immediately texted her and was just like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, it was so much. Um, so we have, um, we haven't talked about research yet, which I would yes. love to get to. I imagine this is a big piece of the book. Um, so how much historical research, we know you went mudlarking, how much other research did you do to, to work on this? Yeah. So as soon as I, you know, I keep coming back to this original genesis of the idea for this apothecary. So as soon as I decided that I wanted to write a book about an apothecary, I started with broad brush research materials. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for anyone who wants to see a list of what these are, if you go on my website under resources, 
there's a kind of a bibliography there of select resources that I use to research the book. And so I started with these general overviews to just kind of get my hands around what does a day in the life of an apothecary look like? And I found this really good resource. I'm not going to get this one down because I'm really scared of my book falling, <laughs> but it's this firsthand account actually of a male midwife who also worked as a, a surgeon in an apothecary. And this was probably the most priceless resource I found because he literally journals, um, I think it was in the mid 1700s. He literally keeps a journal every single day and it even has things like today was the lunar eclipse or today Mrs. Crawford lost her child. Like it's incredibly real and it's all a, tr a real journal um, that's been typed up and kind of edited. And he talks about how much um, you know, money people would have paid him for his services or how much he spent on his wax to make candles. So anyways, I like these firsthand resources about how of someone in a certain profession would have really approached their day. So that was a great resource. And that's on my website. Um, I also did a lot of research on poisons and this was one of the most fun things about the whole research process. And I looked, I kind of covered two different areas of research on poisons. I definitely um, took a look at older uh, manuscripts and documents that had like the Latin names. So I was trying to figure out what would an apothecary have really called a certain remedy or medicine 200 right. years ago. Um, you know, they're going to call them by their Latin names or they're going to have interesting abbreviations. So I tried to, in order to stay true to the historical era, I looked at historical resources, um, you know, pharmacy resources. But then I also, just because they were more fun and easy to read, I looked at contemporary resources as well. One of them, um, if anyone's ever heard of Amy Stewart, she's got a book called Wicked Plants, and it has all of these different and fun um, uh, poisonous plants that we've all heard of um, and kind of how they affect the body and what they look like. There's some really beautiful images in there as well. So the poisons, uh, that was a fun element. And then lastly, if we just think about 18th century London in general, I actually have for several years even before writing The Lost Apothecary, I had an interest in 18th century London. Um, that was when King George III was on the throne. It was a very scandalous time in London's history, um, but we don't see a lot of fiction written in that era. And so I had some base knowledge of how were people getting around? How much did things cost? What right. were people eating for dinner? So it was kind of a lot of different pillars of research um, that went into the book, but I would say the poisons was the most fun to, to yeah. learn about. Uh, another one of our audience members on a similar vein would like to know, did you enjoy the research process as much as the writing process? And did any of your research change your ideas for the book? Um, so the first part of that question, you know, research is a lot of fun in the beginning, but there does reach a point for me where I I'm just done with it. And I just want to write. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is my project that I'm working on right now, which I know we haven't talked about. I've been stalling on the research because I just want to tell the story. And so I have like this shelf of research material that I'm looking at right now. And it just haunts me like every day. I'm just like, I should, I should look at that, but I don't need it right now quite yet for what I'm, what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get the really dramatic story on the page. And then I'll fill in the details later with, with the research stuff. But it's funny, like the more that I write, the more I um, just want to tell the story as quickly as I can and then kind of drop in the really intricate, interesting research as I go. Whereas when I first started writing, I wanted to just dive into the research because that historical piece was so fascinating to me and the writing felt like more work. So it's kind of funny that that's evolved over time. Um, the second part of your question, was there anything that I learned through my research that changed the story? Mm -hmm. You know, I will say um, anyone who has looked closely at the cover, I'm sure you've seen the little green beetle at the yes. bottom. Mm -hmm. That is the cantharides beetle. It plays a pivotal role throughout the story. And I had no idea that that existed until I started researching. And once I learned that there is a beetle that you can crush up and it's an aphrodisiac and then it kills you, I was like, that has to go in my story. <laughs> um, there was no question and it is true that um, in the 1800s, these women in these Parisian brothels would use that beetle as an aphrodisiac. So um, I didn't just make that up in the book. So that was one detail. 
that as soon, I remember as soon as I saw that, I thought the Beatles going in the story. Um, and of course it, it took a very leading role. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another thing that I'm curious to know about too, um, you're talking about doing your research and your writing process. I mean, this is your debut novel. Um, and from what I understand and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were working in finance full time while writing and working on this novel. I mean, one, congratulations, that's incredible. <laughs> and you. two, I would love to know how was, how was it to manage this process of, you know, you know, managing a full-time job, but also, you know, kind of escaping to this, you know, world of writing and editing, you know, how did you manage those two pieces? Yeah, so you're exactly right. I worked, I graduated from the University of Kansas with a degree in finance. That was 2008. And then I worked solid uh, at, at two companies um, over that 13 year period. And I just resigned about three months ago um, to hey. write full time. So yeah, huge life accomplishment. Um, so I look back now and I almost can't believe that I made it all work. Um, but I'll tell you how I did it. I, I'm very much a proponent of the 5 a.m. Writers Club. Um, that's a group of, of people who on Twitter, um, there's a hashtag. If, if you like to write or you want to do something before work, feel free to join us. Um, and you just kind of like get on Twitter and you, you use the hashtag. And there's so many people who write before work because they want to be authors. They want to get published, but they also have bills to pay. And so right. there's a lot of people who believe in the morning writing and, um, not to keep like sending people to my website, but I have a little article on there as well about balancing a day job with a day dream that I did for my alumni association. And it kind of goes a little deeper into the 5.00 AM writing sessions, but that was the only way I could think to write a novel length work of fiction while also working eight to five. And mm -hmm. I am naturally, my body just likes mornings anyways. Yeah. Um, once I get a cup of coffee at 515, like it may as well be nine. I feel very alert. I feel creative. I feel ready for the day. Um, I will say since I've quit my job and I don't have to get up at five, <laughs> I don't. Sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, like I think this morning I, I slept until like eight, which is almost embarrassing because back in the day that would have been like three hours after I normally would get up, but it's a luxury now. So um Don't care. You gotta you gotta <laughs> sleep to fuel those creative brain cells. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Fine. That's right. So yeah, but I would say anybody who who does work a day job and you're wondering when can I write? I really hate to say it, but you're, you're going to lose sleep on one end of the day, whether it's morning or evening, or if you don't want to lose sleep, you're going to have to figure out how to rearrange your other priorities. So, um, maybe over your lunch breaks. Um, I certainly pulled many lunch break editing sessions when I was working full time. Um, I would truly just take my laptop to another room and I would tell my coworkers I'm off for the next hour. I'm working on something else. Mm -hmm. um, so you just have to kind of get aggressive and set boundaries around your time. Yeah. Awesome. That's great advice. Uh, whether you're writing or, you know, as a person, get aggressive, yes. set boundaries with your coworkers. Exactly. We can all set more boundaries. <laughs> exactly. Um, we have a couple like, um, very plot-based questions that I'd love to do like a lightning round for. Yes. That sounds good to you. Let's do it. Cool. All right. Um, here is a, a potential spoiler, everyone. So if you uh, don't want to hear the answer to this question, uh, mute our microphones or mute yourselves so you can't hear this. Um, the question is, can you tell us if Eliza killed her husband and is she using the bookstore as a front for her own apothecary? So since we've given the spoiler alert, um, the earlier question about the sequel uh, yes. and whether there would be one of those, I envision writing the rest of Eliza's story. She would be the oh. sequel character mm -hmm. and the story would open with Tom Pepper's death and, and kind of the mystery behind it. So I'm not going to answer the question you just asked because that will be answered someday. Oh, we all, we all thought that, right? So, <laughs> hmm. Coincidence? I don't know. <laughs> Um, other rapid fire question. How did Nella live beyond when she thought she would die? 
So there's a couple ways to look at it. Um, the first one is we see that Eliza hands her a vial, or we think we see that Eliza hands her a vial. You as the reader get to decide, was that really Eliza? Was that a ghost of Eliza? Is Nella's reference at the very end of the book her really or a ghost? Because it just says that she counsels Eliza. It's one of the many purposely vague uh, things in the story. Awesome. Um, so just so folks know watching and we're going through this lightning round, we're going to go a little bit late, maybe to around 815, because there are still so many questions to answer and we want to answer as many as you can. So um, if you still have some questions, you can pop a few in. Um, but let's let's continue lightning round. Um, was Nella's actual what was Nella's actual illness source physically? Yes, so it wasn't named at the time, which is why I couldn't explicitly state it. But as I wrote, um, I very much was writing symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. And then at the end, it goes into her lungs, um, which is why she starts coughing up blood, et cetera. There are a couple of small clues. So early in the story, she mentions that the pain goes from one of her elbows or shoulders to the other one, mm -hmm. like with seemingly no explanation, which is very classic RA. Um, and one of the reasons why I signed with my agent, this is one of very many, but on our very first call, she, I, she didn't even have to ask. She knew that that's what Nella's disease was. And I thought that that was mm -hmm. such an indication of really close reading and close interpretation, um, that she was able to hone in on that because I, I really never desired, you know, to even explicitly state what it was, but in my mind, I knew. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what's your next book about? Yeah. So, uh, my next book, I can't share a lot about, it hasn't been announced. Um, but what I can say is there are so many things that people have loved about the lost apothecary that they will like in my next book. So a few of those things, uh, I mentioned, I love writing cliffhangers and plot twists. My next book is full of them. Um, it's also set in an atmospheric historical setting mm -hmm. and there it's full of brave, rebellious, um, women who are not well-behaved. And then lastly, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about magical realism and there are different forms of magical realism. So in the lost apothecary, it's actually magic, but there are other ways to make the reader ask if something is real or not real. And there's a, a different, an entirely different element of that question in my next book. Awesome. What's the best piece of writing advice you've received and still use? Yeah, the best piece of writing advice is, and it, it kind of sounds cliche, but you have to turn off your inner critic. And I do this every day. And if people think that now that The Lost Apothecary has been a success, that I somehow know what I'm doing and I feel confident in my writing and I approach the page every day, just like really gung-ho and, and convinced that I'm writing a great story, that could not be further from the truth. I really sit down and agonize a lot of the time about is what I'm telling now even any good? Is this paragraph any good? it never goes away. And, and very well-known authors have said that um, they live with that their entire career. So you have to kind of just learn to sit and hang out with your inner critic. They're not going away. You just kind of have to tune them out. And that's my main piece of advice. And I tell, I've told people, and this is the honest to God truth. I distinctly remember several times reading through the lost apothecary on my own, I was working on revisions and just almost feeling um, like there was zero chance that I will ever even get an agent with this thing. Like I thought it sounded immature and amateur and just um, horrible. And I, I considered trashing it several times, but if you're feeling that way, just, just go, just, you know, stop working for that day and come back to it in the morning. Chances are you're going to feel differently about it. So you just have to turn off the inner critic. Exactly. It's like when you look at something for too long and, you know, you'll never, th you could spend hours tweaking and things, but sometimes the best thing is to just get some space. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, a question that I, <laughs> I love <laughs> um, is I really disliked the husband for so many reasons. Yeah. <laughs> um, the question is, did you intend or expect for that type of reaction? Yeah. So James is who people are talking, yes. who this person's talking about. 
Um, so here's something interesting. When I first wrote this book, James was not as much of a bad guy as he is now in the final version that we've all read. And this isn't to say that, um, you know, that my editor and my agent made him a terrible person, but they did ask me to just keep beefing up the villain in him and finding new and creative ways to make him subtly manipulative. So that's what I did. And, um, he is pretty darn unlikable, oh, but I've actually had people say, and this is not a popular opinion by any means, but I've had people say that in a way they empathize with him. Um, I, like I've had women say this women readers say that they kind of feel for him and they empathize with him, And it kind of makes me laugh because when I first wrote him, he was, he was more nuanced and he, there were some better qualities to him. And while I didn't envision a happy ending necessarily for he and Caroline, I envisioned that there was an open door, more of an open door that they might, you know, successfully make this work someday down the road. Um, now that door is, is there's about an inch that they might be able to walk through someday, but, mm -hmm. um, they both have a lot of changing that they would need to do. Yeah. And that's actually one of the, one of the questions I, I personally had was, um, thinking about Caroline's development and she says to James when they're in the hospital, I need to prioritize me, not your career, not our baby, not our stability and not what everyone else wants from me. And I just imagined like a lot of women reading this and just being like, yes, 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 yes. Like I need to prioritize me for once. I, I would love to just talk a little bit about this change in her and it's in its place within the whole, you know, yeah. novel. You know, what you're describing is reminding me of a podcast I listened to just a few hours ago, um, Glennon Doyle. She's one of my favorite people ever. And she's got a new podcast called We Can Do Hard Things. It's free for anyone who wants to listen. Um, and her episode a couple of weeks ago was on overwhelm and just how women and wives are so overwhelmed and have this ticker of responsibilities that is constantly flashing in our head of all of the things mm -hmm. that we should do, or as you just alluded to with Caroline's story, all of these expectations and just career, baby, marriage, like all of the things. And at what point do we get to just say, you know what, I'm turning the ticker off and I'm choosing not to be overwhelmed. I'm choosing to do something for me and be selfish and, and fulfill something I want. Um, so I think, you know, to answer your question, like what she's saying there and kind of the question that she's asking and, and stating is, something that's really relatable for a lot of us, whether you're a wife or a mother or not. Um, society itself and employers has so many, there's so many expectations on us and that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. And that does, definitely mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we can't question and challenge them and kind of decide for ourselves, like what do we wanna do with this one really exciting life that we get? And um, so that's what Caroline's, questioning. And it's, it's kind of interesting that I was just listening to this podcast today and it's a different way of asking the same question is just what is overwhelming us and are we choosing to be overwhelmed um, or is someone else making us be overwhelmed? I think there are just hard questions that we need to ask ourselves related to that topic. Yeah. And this felt particularly relatable as well, you know, as we're in our pandemic quarantine world and we're seeing a lot of news stories coming out now about how even though both parties are at home, women are still bearing a lot of the brunt of housework, of childcare, while still managing to work remotely. And, you know, thinking about women reentering the workforce, how it's impacting our salaries, things like that. So it it just feel it felt especially relevant you know, with the time we're in as well. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, we have a question from the audience that wants to know, how'd your family feel about read, uh, reading your book and knowing that you were writing about poisons? Yeah. People ask me all the time if, and they ask my husband who's in the office <laughs> behind me, um, they ask, you know, if he's scared to eat by the food that I cook. Um, <laughs> Because I do most of the cooking, which going back to our topic just now about expectations and what we do, I cook because I love to cook, um, not because that's like expected of me. I actually, and I'm a better cook too. So I would rather eat my own food <laughs> than eat my husband. Sure. Um, but no, it's so funny. People always ask like, yeah, are people scared to be around you? Cause you know, all of this about poisons and 
it's, I know they're asking that, you know, to, for, as a joke, but I, I mentioned this in the, um, in the back of the book, something really interesting. I learned while researching the story is that forensic toxicology and the ability to detect poison in human yeah. tissue did not exist until the 1850s. So that's why Nella was able to have such a successful shop in the late 1700s. Um, obviously today, if there's someone who keels over dead, uh, the very first thing they're going to do within like an hour of the police being called is they're going to do an autopsy and, or, or take blood samples or what have you and see right. what's in that person's system. And I guarantee you all of the poisons listed in the lost apothecary are on their basic toxicology test. So, um, I wouldn't make it very far. I would maybe have 30 minutes before they would throw me in jail. So I've obviously, I would obviously <laughs> never ever uh do any harm with any of those poisons it'd be like uh with caroline in the hospital when they say well you have you are the author of the lost yes. so let's put uh two and two together here <laughs> yeah no i know it's funny and you know authors often talk about their google search history and how incriminating it could look but i think at this sure. point um, any FBI agent would know that I write about dark topics and probably just kind of laugh at my search history. <laughs> exactly. Um, someone would like to know, um, we talked about it a little bit, um, but thinking about is the book based on real events and we talked about how they're not real characters, but you know, like has apothecary like this existed? Um, so one that, yeah, there is one very well-known, uh, Julia Tofana. I'm sure that people in the audience have heard of her. And the reason I say that is because I only learned about Julia Tofana when early readers came to me and said, have you heard about Julia Tofana? She killed mm -hmm. men with poison. Um, and it was kind of funny because when I was researching this book, I focused my real life poisoning cases that I was researching. I focused on the United Kingdom and I really didn't look in continental Europe. There was so much good info already just in this one country yeah. um, that I had no need to look elsewhere. And so Julia Tofana lived and worked in Italy in, um, I think it was the 1600s. Mm -hmm. And she had just one concoction known as Aqua Tofana. And I want to say that she marketed it as like a, a perfume of some kind, but long story short, women would come in and buy it and kill their husbands. And ultimately Julia Tofana was executed and I think charged with the deaths of like 600 people. So, um, she was a, you know, very public figure. Um, that said, I think one of the first things my editor asked me when she acquired this book was, do you think that apothecaries like this really lived and worked. And I said vehemently, yes, mm -hmm. I think that they were rampant. And the reason for that is what I just said, that they, the science didn't exist to detect these poisons for another 60 years. Um, so I am positive uh, that in the late 1700s, it was very easy to purchase poison from probably a number of apothecaries or pharmacy like shops. And, um, if you look at the bills of mortality from that era, there are hardly any poisoning deaths, but it's not because they weren't happening. It's because they couldn't determine that that was a cause of death because they didn't have the science. And then as soon as that science existed, boom, it's all over the bills of mortality is that this is how people were dying. So mm -hmm. I guarantee you those murders didn't just start coincidentally <laughs> in 1850 and it had always been happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to bring it to one last audience question, our final question for the evening, um, which is about when you finish writing a book. So you've written, you've created this beautiful world for us and these fantastic characters. We know there's the potential for the future. Um, but when you finish writing the book, did you miss being with your characters? And how did you deal with that? Do you write more of their story? Are you happy to put it aside? Um, how was that ending like? You know, I distinctly remember, um, so after I finished the book and we'd sold it, I knew that there were a number of rounds of revision that I would go through with my editor. And I, each round, I didn't get sad, but then there was that last round. And, you know, my editor had told me like, this is, we're just now doing a few last tiny finishing touches. And I knew this is like my last chance. If there's something I want to say, this is it. If there's something I want for this, these characters, 
this is it. And I distinctly remember telling my husband at the time, this would have been um, about two years ago, um, or maybe a, no, about a year ago, sorry. Um, I distinctly remember telling my husband, like, I feel sad because I do feel like I'm closing this door and I've, you know, I've sold the rights to Harper Collins. They can do whatever they want with it at this point. Mm -hmm. And I don't get a change anymore. I don't get to change anything in the story. And I do remember feeling a sense of sadness um, now, I mean, if you ask me like today, I, it's like, um, as far as East is from West, I'm not sad. I, um, I'm very much <laughs> sure. mentally into my, my next project. Um, I see now things that I wish I had done a little differently in the lost apothecary. I see, um, you know, I've heard themes from people about constructive feedback that I have very thick skin, but some of them I'm like, you know, I, I think that's right. I, if I could go back and make a few more revisions, I would probably do that. Mm -hmm. Nothing, you know, that would change the crux of the story, but right. just a few little details. So, um, but I mean, it, it's, it, it's in print all over the world. So it is what it is. You have to learn to just, um, let it go and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that's, you know, that's great ending advice for us as well. So thank you everyone for being so engaged. We answered like 40 plus audience questions in addition to my own questions. Wow, what a, what a great session <laughs> chatting. So thank you so much for tuning in. And again, a very, very special thanks to you, Sarah, for joining us today. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to answer all of our questions. Yes, um, thank you, Gina. And thank you to everyone who tuned in as well. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been so great. Um, so please, if you really liked this book talk and you're interested in more, um, join us over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our June selection. We'll be reading The People We Meet on Vacation by the Queen of the Beach Read, Emily Henry. The virtual conversation will take place on Monday, July 12th from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, don't forget to join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. So if there were some things that you didn't get to talk about today that you do want to talk about, please go to the Facebook page and put them in. People have been writing and answering each other's questions, so go for it. Um, as our fiscal year comes to a close, you can show your love of Beyond the Page and help us continue with all of this great content next year by becoming a sustaining member today. And with your donation, you'll be able to take home an autographed copy of next month's book. So we look forward to connecting with you again. We hope that you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this time. And thank you again for joining us. Enjoy your evening and uh, hope to see you soon. Take care.